Before we start this week, I've got an important message to play you from Joanne Lamont, who, after the criticism she's received, decided to send us in a little comment. If I could press a button and genuinely solve the unemployment problem, do you think that I would not press that button this instant? Does anyone imagine that there is the smallest political gain in letting this level of unemployment continue? Or that there is some obscure economic religion which demands this level of unemployment as part of its grisly ritual? The question is, do you agree that Scotland should be an independent country? For me, the principle that we work best when we work together without coercion or conscription, bullying or bossiness. Always whenever someone says, oh, peace and sausage, and it's a roll and sausage, and it's a sausage roll, we're better together. Well, they didn't. It was us. We invented it, just like every other bloody thing. <laughs> well, that's very interesting. We have a very serious the referendum. It seems to me that they're not dealing with the issues. <laughs> Hi, if you've been fed up with most of the debate until now, the Scottish Independence Podcast is your chance to hear some different views on what the independence referendum means for Scotland. Hello and welcome to Scottish Independence Podcast number 6. This time I'm talking with Mike Small from Bella Caledonia. We talked a little bit about different strategies that the Yes campaign might adopt. We talked a bit about the ongoing situation with Joan Lamont and, and the importance of suggesting there is an alternative and the concept of universalism. J.K. Rowling even gets a wee look in as well somewhere. So I hope you enjoy it and I'll have a wee word with you at the end. All right, so Mike Small, you're the editor, I suppose, of Bella Caledonia and you've been involved in a lot of other media projects and it's fair to say you're probably in the Yes camp. So um, in terms of strategy, what do you think the Yes campaign is doing well at the moment and what do you think they're doing badly at the moment? Well, I think it's just starting, really. I think what they're doing well and what they're probably going to have to do more of is the is the kind of communities of interest and the different bodies that are emerging, like the uh, LGBT, the, um, the Women for Independence, the Creatives for Independence, all those kind of groups emerging, I think, are going to be the real strength of the campaign. So, in a way, what they have to do is just liberate that energy and let people do their own stuff and so it's quite a different sort of focus for some of these people who've been political campaigners and have been by definition kind of control freaks you know because this is not about that this is about allowing people to express what they're attracted to in the notion of the possibility of a new Scotland and that's a very very different sort of task and challenge than Uh, a kind of Peter Mandelson style, everybody stick to the message, I'm going to get you on your mobile and your pager with the lines you've got to say. Um, So it'll be really interesting to see whether they're able to do that. But I think it's quite interesting the people that they've called in, uh, they've appointed recently, uh, people like Stan Blackley and Stuart Kirkpatrick. So, you know, I think that, that really looks good. But it is a different challenge because it's all about liberating other people to do stuff. Other people like Shirley Ann Somerville, it's really interesting appointment, uh, Susan Stewart. So uh, they've got a good mix of really dynamic people, and what they need to do is let them get on with it. Mm. And what do you think they're not doing well? Something like on Twitter, for mm. example. Like I, I've just got their Twitter feed here. I'm looking at it, and it's just, you know, yes, Scotland events, show your support, sign the declaration, can you donate, want to work for Yes for Scotland. Like, if it was me... I would have someone on there permanently responding to people instead of kind of diktats. I would have them, you know, engaging, speaking to people constantly. I think I think that's a bit of a mistake, the way that they're running their Twitter feed. I don't know how you find it. Yeah, I think, but maybe they don't need to run their Twitter feed because maybe there's, you know, 100,000 other uh, independent-minded people writing more provocative, interesting stuff. So I don't think they need to control everything and I don't think they need to run everything. I think they're probably just creating forums. What I think would be interesting for them to do more of, and uh, I hope they will, is more live events. And these aren't about big rallies, but about gigs and exhibitions and... uh, 
concerts and Kayleys and all sorts of different scaled events because I think there's something uh, in the nature of live events that um, is going to be really pivotal about uh, inspiring people in a way that uh, a, trip or, a Twitter stream isn't going to. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's something about the combination of social media and live events and the dynamic between the two that could become really interesting, and I, I, I look forward to them doing a bit more of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Have you been to a few yourself? There's been a few so far. Well, obviously it was at the rally, and... Uh, that was interesting in terms of the, the spin room afterwards and who, who claimed that. But I, what, what you experienced was that everybody who was at the event was absolutely buzzing from it and thought it was fantastic. Uh, and then there was all these people kind of dissing it and trying to um, distort it afterwards. So I think that's the point, that if you're at a live event with real people and you had now have this phenomenon of meeting people and, and it, announcing yourself by your Twitter handle... <laughs> And that's, people find that really refreshing. So like, ah, right, okay, that's you. And that's a great moment because it is uh, face-to-face. There is nothing to replace face-to-face contact. Yeah, for um, increasing the energy levels and helping to organise new events and stuff. like Exactly, yeah. Creating little communities, like you said earlier. Exactly. In the, in the face of, if it's not overtly hostile, it's... They will pick and choose. They will selectively ignore certain events. How can Yes Scotland kind of force itself into the mainstream? If 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 you were in charge, how would you try to do that? I wouldn't. I think it's about uh, releasing, uh, unleashing all of the anarchy of uh, the creativity that's that's on the rampage in Scotland. If you think about projects like Egg Box on the Island of Egg, which is a kind of social enterprise encouraging cultural and economic activity. And I think there's still been something like making the peripheral central. Or if you think about Blip Photo or Northern Lights, the film project that recently uh, asked Scots to kind of reflect their own lives on film. Or if you think of the sort of potty-mouthed Glasgow podcast, or, or various online initiatives that all have at the centre of their, at the core of their, their idea, participation and expression and creativity. So I think all that YES needs to do is open the door to those voices and let those those uh, those energies out. I think the more they try and um, stamp everything YES, the, um, the less that's going to work. But a lot of these things have an explicit independence uh, tag attached to themselves and haven't necessarily made themselves politically known, but they are emerging as part of this new YES movement. Also, I think, you know, as well as some of these ideas, there's other energies that are coming forward. You know, I mean, if you look at Ruth Wishart coming out and announcing her backing for the yes, yes vote. If you look at uh, stuff like the um, the new book by Scott Hames, uh, which is done with um, uh, word power books, and that's Writers on Scottish Independence. You know, there's some really interesting stuff emerging with both journalists, and commentators who previously felt they, they needed to be independent or couldn't say where they where they their vote lied, that's shifting. And I think that's part of the shift in the media. I think that's part of the media kind of dissembling and beginning to become more interesting. But also some of the books we've seen recently um, and new writing coming out. So Scott Hames' book is Writers on Independence, and it's got an extraordinary, extraordinary collection of people, including Alan Bissett, Kath and Jamie, Don Patterson, Denise Mia, James Kelman, Janice Galloway, Alistair Gray, you know, a really, really rich uh, stream of people. Some of the people from Variant that we had a, a big debate on Bella Caledonia recently. So I think what's happening is the media may continue to trot out its, its unionist line, but at the same time, this creative energy from the writers and the thinkers in Scotland is coming out, out with much more nuanced, um, radical, complex and interesting analysis that people are going to respond to and engage with. And it will just sort of brush aside the sort of uh, rubbish that the, uh, the mainstream media comes out with. So are you terrified that J.K. Rowling came out for the union? <laughs> yes, yes. English billionaire living in mansion in Edinburgh is against the union. Well, she's yeah. a fantasist, so... She is a princess, that's right. But I'm glad she thinks that we're all doing very well. That's great. Mm. <laughs> I always thought like, she used to sort of write 
in a cafe because she didn't have any money. Well, I don't know if that's a bad thing to say, but I thought she used to write the books in a cafe in Edinburgh because she couldn't afford to heat her house, but she thinks we're all doing very well. That seems uh, somewhat contradictory to me. That's right. She's a single mum, isn't she? And uh, she's on the bread line. Um, <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that's pulling the ladder up or if it's just she's been um, a fantasist for too long. She's a good friend of the Browns. I'm sure she's a lovely lady. I've always thought her books were crap. I think she's a much better marketing woman than, than a writer, but you're not allowed to say that. Um, I don't know if I have to give her some credit. She made the kids read again, but I'm not going to talk about the literary brilliance of the books. Doesn't matter well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's funny you say that, actually. When I was um, 16 years old, I was caught in the school library reading Train Spotting by the headmaster, and he was giving me, this is before the film and everything, he was giving me dogs abuse. You shouldn't be reading that. Where did you get that? <laughs> he, confis- he confiscated it. This is interesting. He, I, I actually had that book confiscated from me. I just went and read it again, but there you go. Oh, the mark of good literature. Just one more question about this. Sure. Here, this stuff. Like, okay, I agree with you about, you know, unleashing the potential and the internet communities, uh, mixing them with real communities. But at the same time, the television for better or worse, is still the most important medium. Or not the most important, but it's the one that most people see. I mean, yeah. I'm sure if I'm inventing words now, but internet users, Facebook users, Twitter users, we're all very internet-centric. Yeah. And, um, we all have our own little online world as well as our real world world. But do you think that the Yes campaign can do well without television coverage? No, they probably need to uh, engage with that, and there probably needs to be a strategy for or um, demanding some kind of even-handedness in that terrain. I think that um, when that even-handedness is denied them, that is going to go down very badly, though. So, in a way, they're in a a win-win situation there because they'll either be given appropriate airspace uh, or they will be denied that, and that will work very badly in the the Twitter sphere and in the alternative uh, world where these things are discussed. So... Um, I'm not sure if I quite believe the idea that um, the mainstream media or the EBC can sort of clamp down on the Yes campaign and and, um, and usher it out. I don't think that's going to be possible. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, to change the subject a bit, um, there's obviously been major news this week. I had a little chat with um, uh, James Maxwell about it earlier, and Wings Over Scotland did the best tweet today. Uh, it was an online poll of choose your favourite kicking of jo- Joanne Lamont <laughs> <laughs> with a list of all the articles abusing her, which I thought was quite funny, actually. They had the one um, from the guy from Lennon's tomb in The Guardian, which I thought was fantastic. Uh, I don't know if you read that one. Is that the one, um, why, are, why are they so abysmal? Yes. Which I, I th- why is Scottish so abysmal? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that was very funny, yes. Uh, so, so they've got, um, on their list, they've got Richard Seymour, who's, that was the guy in The Guardian, who's currently winning, yeah. Ian Bell, Robin McAlpine, Ian McWhorter, Willie Sullivan, Suki Sanga, Joyce McMillan, George Eaton and Jonathan Shaffey. On the podcast episode four, we had James Maxwell delivering his kicking. Um, would you care to deliver another one? Yeah, well, I'm really disappointed that uh, Bella Caledonia is not in that top ten um, <laughs> because we've, we've had a couple of efforts. Um, but I suppose what we've also tried to do is um, is uh, make a positive case for universalism and sort of look at what the roots are of that thinking, um, both in um, sort of post-war labour policy, uh, the roots of the National Health Service, but also at, before that, at people like Stanley Diamond, the uh, anthropologist, and Paul Radin, who talked about the idea of the irreducible minimum, which is this idea that you, in order to be part of the tribe, in order to be a member of society, in uh, organic societies, there was a basic level of uh, facilities that you were you were allowed. So you were allowed to be healthy and to have a house and have enough to eat. And if you're a member of the tribe, uh, a bona fide part of society, that was just to be expected because that's what you needed to be able to participate. And that's kind of the roots of universalism. It's very deep rooted. It it might have its latest political expression in post-war labour policy, but it goes much deeper than that in human society of people expecting and demanding that in order to be civilised at some very basic level, you have universal provision. So um, I'm all for giving Joanne Lamont and her advisors a good kicking because it's it's ridiculous and I think it's collapsing for them. 
But I'm also quite interested in looking at the positive case for universalism and it's reaffirming that because sometimes when these uh, policy ideas come forward, they get slated, but they subtly shift the debate. And uh, I think we need to watch against that. And what we need to do is use this as an opportunity to reaffirm some of these values and re-explore why they're absolutely essential. Yeah, effectively, this was Joanne Lamont's uh, There is no alternative speech, but you're saying that we should um, reaffirm that there are alternatives. Absolutely. I mean, I think what's happened, I saw the assistant editor of The Scotsman tw- tweeting today saying, um, you know, uh, she's obviously lost the argument, so how do we pay for it? And I, I saw uh, Joyce McMillan calling it um, boss class miserableism. Um, and as you said, Richard Seymour starts his, spe- his um, piece in The Guardian saying, why is the Scottish Labour leadership so abysmal? Why has it struggled to adapt to post-devolution Scottish politics? And why does it keep having to rings run around it by the SNP? You know, I mean, it has been a complete car crash. And if they try and retreat from it, that will be very difficult as well. So I think we're looking at uh, another moment where Scottish Labour leadership comes out with something and then faces a, a kind of barrage of negativity and it's it's so unsure of itself, it may well now go, ah, right, OK, well, we didn't actually mean that, or we were just sort of chatting amongst ourselves or something ridiculous. And, and if they do that, their credibility is further undermined. So I think we will be looking at defections, and I think we will be looking at, you know, leadership questions emerging after this debacle. Could it actually lead to a split? Well, I don't know where you would split to. Um, I, I, I don't think there's. I don't think they've got enough energy or co- coherence to split. <laughs> I, I think it'll just um, uh, more collapse than split, or people defecting uh, to the SNP, or uh, I, I don't think the, the other uh, left parties are strong enough to really engage people either. So it might be to the Greens or the SNP. If there is a collapse, where would the opposition to the SNP go? It's a very difficult question, I know. The, the opposition to the SNP? Yeah, what do you mean? If, if Labour collapsed, where would people who hate the SNP, of which there are many, uh, where would where do you think their votes would defect to the Conservatives, or would um, they just be total SNP dominance? Well, yeah, I, in a way I think we're beyond party politics, because I, I think that the referendum is going to dominate the landscape so much that, you know, who cares really? Um, about the next uh, Scottish election. It's not really about the next Scottish election, it's, a, it's about the referendum, it's about whether you want to be a sovereign country. So I think already people are looking towards beyond on that, either for a yes or a no result, rather than focusing on an actual election. This is what Kevin Williamson was saying in the, his recent article on the site. He, it's about the referendum now, policies for the 2016 election. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's going to be uh, devastating for whoever loses that result. But I mean, that's one of the extraordinary thing about Jean Lamont's um, announcements this week. They're basically establishing themselves to the right, firmly to the right. And, you know, you just wonder who is actually uh, advising on that. Because although you can you can argue that there's a conservative strand in Scottish politics that doesn't vote Tory but is small C conservative, and although people are concerned about the idea of living on the never never as a, as a lovely expression was used, um, everybody's uh, concerned about that. <clears throat> but this is such a disavowal, it's such a shutting down of the debate that I can't see it having any electoral gain whatsoever for Labour. I can only see it being um, a real, real um, problem and a uh, train wreck has been described. So, Mike, where would you like to see the Yes campaign going in the next couple of months? Um, I think we need some live events. I think we need them all across the country. I think we need to really see the energy emerge from the, uh, the New Scots for Independence and the Creators for Independence and all those groups, and um, I also think that it's absolutely crucial that um, we begin to engage with young people who are 14, 15, 16, 17. Um, I think that will be really interesting to see who does that best, how that can happen, and um, what kind of response that gets. Thanks very much, Mike. Okay, speak to you soon. Thanks. Bye. Hi, I hope you enjoyed that, and um, that was Mike Small from Bella Caledonia. I will have a couple more episodes for you next week, but I just want to say thanks for all your support. 
all the reviews and retweets and Facebook likes and everything that you've given us. Please keep it up. It's great that you're doing that and it helps us out. And like I say every week, if you want to get in touch about something, please do. To finish, here's Mike's Vowel's Choice of Song, which is Orange Juice, Rip It Up.